Welcome back to lecture two. Uh, this is lecture 2B, HR framework of uh, understanding. So um, to follow up, uh, we kind of completed our, our area on goal setting and strategy tactics and how that fits in. Um, to really get a handle on HR as a whole, it's good to put it on, into a framework of understanding so it's easier to um, manipulate things around and see where they fit and then you can sort of see how they intermesh because everything kind of intertwines so there's uh, uh, definitely no one category with HR a lot of it intersects as you'll see throughout the course uh, but this framework's pretty good for you to be able to um, position and understand what's going on so we'll be looking at the five categories and then after that we'll also look at job types how we can sort of categorize um, jobs keep in mind that nothing is perfect in, in how things fit into the different areas uh, but there definitely is certain patterns and uh, uh, networks that that come together as uh, the categories are built out so the five uh, categories that we'll be looking at uh, which is very similar to other frameworks, uh, category one, social, political, legal, and economic, uh, the workforce, the organization's culture that uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, the organization's strategy that we've also talked about, and the technology of production and organization of work. Uh, so when asking uh, does the HR system how how does the HR system fit in a specific situation it helps with that framework that I was uh, mentioning and just to keep in mind that uh, the whole framework is is sort of uh, part of a bigger system because HR fits into the overall corporate system you know you got the financial side you've got the operations side uh, you've got the HR side, you've got the marketing side, sales and marketing. So they all intertwine uh, with each other. Without the HR, though, you have nothing because you have nobody to produce the goods, the services uh, that are required. So, you know, it's not that uh, any company can do without that. It definitely has to have that. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, these are the five categories that we will get into. Uh, the textbook that I referenced in the actual course outline, uh, very good textbook. Uh, you may want to reference it uh, yourself. Uh, if you want to purchase it, go ahead. You don't have to purchase it for this course. Uh, some people like uh, to, um, you know, have a deeper reference. I years ago used to use this book all the time but they really haven't updated it in like 20 years so I, I think it's not uh, if they'd been updating I probably would be still using it but uh, things uh, some of the examples in that uh, uh, can be problematic sometimes uh, just when they ex use an example of a company being good and then really it was a problem uh, turned out to be a problem later on that kind of um, deflates a few things although I did say in good to great I like the fact that a lot of the great companies are gone because uh, it just goes to show you that uh, unless you keep doing the things that uh, made you great um, you're not going to stay great and plus things change and uh, you know uh, Tom Brady and the New England Patriots can't win the Super Bowl every single year they win quite a bit but they can't win every single year uh, so when we talk about other uh, broader uh, frameworks that are out there that you'll probably run into when you do some of your assignments and that PESTLE, uh, which is very similar to what we're talking about in one, which is the external environment, uh, breaks it down into political, economic, social, technological, legal, uh, and E for environmental. And then there's Porter's Five Forces. Uh, my, after Michael Porter's Five Forces. Uh, I think this is uh, part of where this framework was developed from, from the authors of the textbook that I was mentioning. Uh, comp competition in the industry, potential of new entrants into the industry, power of suppliers, power of customers, and threat of substitute products. And this really kind of gives you an idea as a business where you stand, and it's, it, it's another form of a SWOT analysis but it's much more specific because it addresses a lot of different factors that are going on that can impact the future success of the business. Uh, so it's another one that's pretty uh, good to um, look up and get a little bit of a handle on uh, how business uh, needs to um, find itself in a particular framework. 
of uh, competition and change that's going on in the marketplace. This will cover off pretty well uh, today, I think. Uh, the so number one, the external environment. Uh, we can think of the boundaries of the external environment. There's the social, political, legal, economic pressures that are put on businesses. So the social forces, those are things like uh, what's normal for a particular society. Uh, this is, you know, when you talk about global companies, you have to remember they're in different countries and there's different local uh, norms that are quite different from one country to the other. So what are those and how does that impact the business? And uh, in some countries, uh, you know, society looks at status uh, and some countries like the status of your job, employment uh, means a lot. Uh, in other countries, not so much. It's more about just pay. Um, so it, it depends uh, from that perspective on some of the societal forces that uh, in the market that are involved in the marketplace that you're serving. Uh, what sorts of behavior are frowned upon and what behavior is condoned? What behavior is accepted? Uh, what are the view, what are viewed as the social responsibilities of the firm? Uh, what types of organizational control are acceptable and legitimate? Again, you have different employment laws that you must uh, satisfy. And you can understand that going from one country to another country or a developing country can be quite different than, say, in a developed uh, country. Uh, so the, the social forces, even, in, you know, you take the United States, there can be significant differences between one state and another state uh, and uh, the laws that are involved in that process. So it is quite uh, interesting when you think about the social forces and how that impacts how a business treats its employees and how employees act uh, within that business. Well, the political environment, I don't think I have to say too much about that with what's been going on in the political environment with the last uh, few years, uh, but definitely, uh, you know, what? how does that impact companies? Well, if you've all of a sudden uh, have a trade agreement and the trade agreement is put into jeopardy, there's uncertainty and business does not like uncertainty, it likes a lot more certainty in its uh, practices. So how do political pressures work and impact an organization in terms of its HR policies and practices? You can see how societal norms, political environments can play into things. You got companies uh, during a global pandemic are trying to open up. In some environments, politically, it's very supported. In other environments, it's not supported. In some areas, it doesn't matter what the political side is because the societal side may not want to go into those premises. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of forces that play on uh, a business. And uh, governments can put a lot of impediments uh, from a political uh, process uh, if you're trying to unionize a company. We'll look at this later in the course. If you're trying to unionize a, cor a company, that can have some pretty dramatic of impacts on um, the business. Legal environment. So what are the legal requirements uh, of the firm? What rights do workers have both individually and collectively? What sorts of employment practices are sanctioned? Uh, again, that ties into societal societal puts pressure on government political to enact laws and regulations the legal environment and then there's enforcement that comes through uh, laws and regulations that are put into place and what are we able to do currently and what are we unable to do currently the economic environment well if we're in a boom it's quite different than if we're in a recession and Booms can be very local in nature. Uh, you can say like Alberta, for example, uh, could have an oil and gas boom and then it can have a recession in that area. And having done a lot of work in Alberta myself, uh, I know that when I go in there and things are really going well, it is very easy to get work and uh, to name your price. And we'll talk about balance of power later in the course, but uh, it's a different environment than when you go in there and everybody's getting laid off and, you know, I get an attack uh, in an Uber. I always take Uber. I, I get into an Uber uh, car and I start talking to the Uber driver and it turns out that this was uh, an industrial engineer who's been laid off and he's just trying to make ends meet until things get better. Uh, so the economic environment 
uh, can vary uh, from geographic locations, uh, from company to company within a geographic location. One company could have got a lot of contracts, the other one not, uh, just because of how they were able to procure it. Uh, so that can also affect the, the type and culture in a business. You know, if your company's not doing too well and they've been letting people go and they've been contracting over the last five years, uh, the culture is going to be one of nervousness. Uh, it's, it's not going to be as uh, proactive. It's going to be more protective of, of the individual people who will be acting more in a cautious way. Uh, and the best of people may have already left because they have choices, uh, whereas the people that don't have that much choices, they're kind of locked into the company. Uh, so the big difference uh, in how companies are doing, if it's really successful and expanding and growing, it's a different kind of environment. Think of Google, uh, how it's been growing over the last uh, 15, 20 years, and being part of that would be much more kind of exciting kind of environment than one that is uh, contracting like... Uh, let's say Kodak uh, or even SNC-Lavalin probably uh, over the last few years. Uh, the workforce. So that number two is the workforce, mostly demographic issues. How old is the workforce? How well educated is the workforce? Uh, so, so, social homogeneity, uniformity of sex is, there, is it, you know, mostly of uh, male or uh, female. Uh, is it um, is it uh, older? Maybe people the business started 25 years ago, and most of the people that started are still there, and that really hasn't changed so much. Um, then there'd be a, a huge discrepancy in the demographic of age. Uh, that could be a, an issue. Maybe not uh, a, a group not willing to change as quickly as say a little bit younger workforce. Uh, so there can be different factors that play into that. Or, or sometimes it's very mixed. You've got a real diversion of age, culture, uh, backgrounds, uh, which again can be uh, very advantageous for a business because they're not rooted in one particular train of thought. Uh, occupational mix, uh, it could be also that the workforce is very specific. You know, everybody's an engineer, everybody's a type of engineer. Uh, or it could be much more uh, mixed. Uh, think of uh, the construction industry. And if it's a construction company, you can have engineers, you can have business managers, project managers, different tradespeople, uh, a, a pretty uh, diverse uh, mix of people involved or skill sets involved. So um, the workforce has, has a play and the type of business that you're in, that has a play on it uh, and how diverse it is. Um, <clears throat> The organizational culture, uh, so the culture refers to things like um, norms of conduct. So what, what normally goes on within this business? How do people typically behave in this business? Some businesses, everybody starts at eight and they go home at five. Others, the norm of conduct is they stay around and they keep working till like seven or eight o'clock at night. The boss is still here, so we're still here. They're on salaries and uh, quite different from company to company what's a norm of uh, conduct. And sometimes it takes uh, somebody to sort of challenge that or to change that or uh, sometimes it, that's the way it is and that's just the way that this business uh, runs and how people view that. Uh, values and assumptions about the relationships that govern uh, the behavior at the organization. It it's, can be quite interesting to look at and to um, study that way. I can remember when I started um, teaching at George Brown College many years ago. <clears throat> it was kind of interesting because when I first started, everybody kind of wore a suit and uh, uh, people would start at a certain time and they would finish. And, you know, faculty would be there like all day and they would come and go. And I remember one faculty one time saying, why, why are we all here? We don't have to be here. And there was nothing in any contract, but it was a norm of conduct. And then once that kind of got broken, of course, what, what happened too was, you know, it was easier to do work from home and other sort of things like that. It just kind of went that way and changes the culture for sure. Uh, and actually going back to that right now, the way everybody it's changing, it's going to change many cultures. There's going to be adjustments uh, based on uh, the impact of a pandemic forcing people to work from home. It means that a culture that was normally everybody's here in the office uh, now is not there. And you do that for long enough after when 
things are more normal and you want to go back to um, normal work, uh, it's not so easy to do. Uh, people won't want to do it. People will have opportunities where they can work from home. Uh, some people will love to work at the office as opposed to home, but then there's some people that want to work from home. So there will be changes that probably wouldn't have happened so fast as a result of uh, this pandemic that, that occurred uh, in the workforce because it kind of forced things to upgrade uh, and change and adjust. Some people are very rooted in um, you know, meeting people in person and that sort of thing. Uh, but now they're seeing they can do this online and they don't have to sit in two hours of traffic to go to an in-person meeting. They could actually do a quick uh, Zoom meeting. Well, look at me. I'm doing this course online. Uh, typically, I did this course uh, live at U of T. I've done enough online courses in the past, but uh, this particular course was usually done uh, in person. Um, so there's different ways and avenues. And then as you get better at adjusting and improving, then you can actually um, up your game somewhat as, as the technology improves, but the use of it and the application of it improves. Um, so these things will impact um, culture as well. And what type of culture is it? Is the culture one of cooperation or competition? We'll talk about that in uh, another lecture. Um, is it like a big happy family or dog eat dog? Um, is work itself regarded as joy or drudgery? It depends on the, the vocation and what it is that um, uh, the craft and also depends on the culture and people's attitudes towards what they do. Is conformity important or is more div diversity in how you act and behave uh, okay or important? And uh, how does the company view its employees? Some companies you're just a cog in the wheel. Other companies you're a valued asset part of the the company. Um, so as I mentioned, more like a big happy family kind of environment. Uh, so uh, and ideological changes that have occurred can also have an impact on, on culture and the way uh, thinking that the employees have. And uh, so changes in how the company is behaving, directions. We talked about vision and strategies. Sometimes uh, if it's a complete change or reversal, that can impact uh, the employee's overall view of the business. So uh, organizations, sometimes also within an organization, you have subcultures. So sometimes the organizations display uh, diverse organizational cultures, just, you know, this is the group of engineers, this is the group of uh, laborers, this is the group, and they kind of separate themselves uh, within the business. Um, and uh, some companies think they can just sort of engineer or work out what the, the culture should be in the subcultures. You can definitely influence it, but it's, def it's definitely difficult to say this is exactly how this is going to be and this is what we're going to do. Uh, but you can do certain behaviors that will align with the type of culture that you want. And that can be very, very helpful in directing the culture to be one that you think will benefit the organization uh, the most or whoever is running that organization if they want to do that. Definitely if they try to engineer culture but then they behave counter to what they're trying to engineer, it's cause for conflict and it's cause for disorientation. So uh, you can also uh, compare cultures. I think in the video one I talked about uh, WestJet versus Air Canada. You can definitely see one is more policy procedure oriented, one is more uh, one of flexibility. I think of uh, in, in the construction business, I can think of uh, a couple of examples like an Ellis Dawn and a PCL, both excellent companies, top of their game. Uh, one is a little bit more uh, uh, concerned with innovation and ensuring that that parameter is built into the DNA of the company. The other one is much more procedural process systems oriented. And we talked about systems in this class and they're both very good at what they do. Um, you have to be careful if you have too much systems that you stifle innovation. You have to be careful if you have too much uh, innovation, like freedom, flexibility to do what you want. Maybe some people are going to do things they shouldn't do. So they're both trying to fit within their culture and their envelope to leverage themselves to their um, greatest uh, purpose. And that's, that's a struggle where how much is too much policy and procedure, but we need it. How much is not enough policy and procedure, 
you know, vice versa to protect the business. So these are things that happen and occur uh, as you look at comparisons of culture. Uh, and we'll talk about North American auto versus the Japanese auto industries, at least the traditional perspectives, continuous improvement differences, uh, more realignment today than there was in the past. Uh, is customer service a key to being competitive? So is, is it the customer? Um, so the organizational strategy, uh, <clears throat> what are we trying to, um, what are we trying to accomplish? What, uh, what's the path we're going to take to reach our overall goals, as we said, with being strategic? Um, uh, so if so, uh, how could this have an impact? Some examples, policies can impact customer service for the business we just discussed. What elements can assist employees? in uh, customer service and looking at the organizational strategy and making sure that things are in alignment for you to set that path and achieve your goal and then the tactics as we break things down that we're going to do day to day and realignments that we'll do to that to help us reach our overall goals and the fifth one here is the technology of production and organization of work um, as opposed to so we'll, for this one, we're, we're going to think about uh, technology as tools and equipment. Um, well, we're actually, in this case, we're not going to think of it as the tools and equipment. Tools and equipment being more the conditions uh, that we set about with the business. Um, so how are the tasks organized? How is the, the business organized? How is the layout for the actual uh, office uh, done? Are we Now I should be saying, are we working from home, etc.? So we can break that down into these areas physical layout, worker privacy, proximity, uh, required skills, monitoring employee input, task ambiguity and creativity, and patterns of worker interdependence and cooperation depending on the type of work that you're doing. So physical layout, well, we could probably spend a, a class on this by itself. Uh, you know, how are we laying out and are we laying out with consideration for collaboration, interaction, uh, what's the best way for us to accomplish that. Everything has pluses and minuses. You know, if you've got everybody in close proximity to each other, maybe everybody can hear each other talking on the phone and different things of that nature, and then it's a distraction and nobody gets any really focused work in. Uh, but if you have everybody apart, then how do we get collaboration and uh, innovative ideas and better engagement? This is one of the things that we're struggling with uh, with uh, working from home, some companies are. Uh, so uh, is the location good? Has it been thought about for the flow of information through the organization? Uh, and uh, do you have opportunities to have privacy if you want to have private meetings? Maybe there's rooms that you can book for that. Uh, or are we going to do the hoteling lay layout where everything is wide open uh, and that sort of situation? For sure, those uh, kind of situations during a pandemic become problematic. Uh, there'll be shields put up and different things like that to separate people. But other than that, the idea was, well, people can sit wherever they want. And maybe we have our people work two days from home, three days in the office or vice versa. It saves a lot of office space, can save costs, and you can still arrange it that you have good interaction. Uh, can workers focus on their work or are they distracted? And again, individually, people have different temperaments, different abilities to focus. Think of yourself when you study. Could you study in a coffee shop? You sure? Some people can't study in a coffee shop because there's too much stuff going on. Other people, no problem studying in a coffee shop. If they study in a quiet place at home, they get distracted because it's too quiet for them. Uh, just depends on personality and it depends on certain habits. There's probably a limit for the noise in a coffee shop somebody can handle, but um, even myself, I'm pretty good in a coffee shop at uh, getting a lot of work done and that sort of thing. But uh, it depends on the individual. So um, can workers focus on their work and is there that ability uh, to do that? And have you thought of that during the layout of the office? This has been a problem with hoteling where they didn't really think about some private rooms that could be booked for what we what um, Cal Newport, uh, who's a professor and author, uh, wrote about in a book called Deep Work. Deep Work discusses the ability to dive deep into a topic and be able to focus on that topic and move into flow 
uh, when you're working on these types of uh, projects, which we'll discuss these points later in the course. Can clients uh, easily access required information through the business, through the layout? Is there places to meet with clients? Uh, if they come to the front, is there a reception? Is, it, is there a good, easy flow for them to uh, meet who they're supposed to meet, etc.? And um, technology, of course, has played a huge role in our ability to do things like this course, to do live uh, meetings with products like Zoom and uh, MS Teams and Google Meet, and I could keep going on and on WebEx, a uh, lot of different tools uh, out there, and they're becoming more, uh, more ubiquitous, more easy to use, more easy to adopt. So that people don't even care about um, whose tool it is, they'll figure it out, it's not too difficult. Uh, required skills, number two. Uh, so what skills do you need to perform this work? And we'll talk about job postings and things later in the course. So what would be the job requirements that you would put into a job posting? Uh, are do do those skills, are they achieved outside the organization? Like do you have to have an engineering degree? Uh, and what training is required when they actually join the organization? And how long is the learning curve for that individual? So we'll, again, we'll look at that uh, at later in the, in the course. But some jobs, you know, if it's like a Starbucks, they have a certain training program that they put in place that a barista can be trained in X amount of days. And they know that probably that barista is not going to stay with them for 20 years. They know that barista might stay while they're in college or university uh, and they want to make things work for them during that time period. So they'll probably have flexible schedules that that can work with them for that period of time. But they also know that it's not going to be that long beyond it. So they want to make sure that they can get a person up to speed in a short period of time because there's a much more rotation in a job like that than say uh, another type of job, maybe an engineering job where it might be uh, a longer stay at a particular business. So uh, people's uh, view of a company really is dependent on um, the culture of the organization. And, you know, if you start out, uh, if anybody's ever done a uh, co-op program and that and you've gone to a company and they really didn't treat you very well or they didn't expect you and you're kind of like, um, the fifth wheel uh, definitely didn't do much to make you want to work for that company when you were done. They kind of shot themselves in the foot because it's a great opportunity for a company uh, to get good people and check out how they are. But if you kind of put that person off the first day, it uh, gives a bad first impression. It's hard to recover from that. So uh, definitely a, a positive HR culture would be trying to ensure that uh, co-ops would run smooth, onboarding of new people would run smoothly um, so that there's a positive experience and you start to engage with the, the new hires right away instead of demotivate them and put them off because they might have been quite excited to start with and then they were kind of demotivated uh, very quickly. So monitoring employee input. Um, really, usually when you're monitoring input, you're looking at output. Uh, so... Uh, well, that's one of the things that uh, goes on with uh, employee input. Makes it difficult, though, if it's not that objective, the work, that you can't measure it that easily. If it's more subjective or it's based on things outside the employee's control, then it's not really deemed to be fair. And that would be uh, a problem uh, for the business because if you're, moni if you're monitoring employee uh, input based on their output and there's things in the system that's preventing them to be successful, then it's not really fair to uh, monitor them based on that. You have to look for other avenues and other ways that you can uh, better uh, monitor that would reflect uh, their abilities. Task ambiguity and creativity. So if you hear the term task ambiguity, it means if you have high task ambiguity, means the task is pretty complex. If you have low task ambiguity, it's pretty straightforward. So if you have something that's fairly straightforward, uh, that would be low task ambiguity. 
and um, that would be easily that would probably be easier to measure output to be sure uh, and uh, creativity would be come into play much more in high task ambiguity jobs where you've got complexity problem solving etc and a lot of in, obviously engineering processes uh, will have uh, typically high task ambiguity some may have low but generally speaking it would be higher because it's required a, a higher thought process problem solving process higher knowledge base uh, process uh, but you know what sometimes jobs too that are fairly uh, overall fairly low task and amb ambiguity it's always interesting to watch somebody that's gotten really good at that even if it's low task ambiguity somebody that's mastered that uh, a few months ago uh, we, i was at a mcdonald's and i was there was a lineup this was before the pandemic and there was a long lineup uh, and it was this one in barry and uh, it was like not moving and everybody behind the counter just seemed to be in a daze and didn't know what they were doing and this kid that was sitting at one of the benches uh, I guess with his girlfriend got up and he went behind the counter so I assume the kid uh, generally uh, works there uh, but he was on he was uh, just brought his girlfriend to the McDonald's that he works at I guess and he went behind the counter he goes oh can I help out uh, I see you guys are having trouble right this one kid uh, who was probably maybe about 18, um, was a whirlwind. Like the kid was serving everybody left, right, and center. Uh, I remember he got uh, my coffee, which I was kind of grateful for. Uh, and there was uh, getting something for my wife there. And he asked one of the people to do something uh, while he would do something else. And he saw that person wasn't doing it because they were in uh, spaced out. Uh, and he actually just smoothly went in and did the other thing and ev everything just went so smooth with this guy he deserved a gold medal so it's it's always interesting when you watch somebody who's in his young age but it was low task ambiguity overall but he's figured it out at a high level like very little waste of motion he's mastered that process that he could do easily do the work of three uh, people that were kind of sluggish and not really into it and not engaged. He wasn't even being paid and he, he was engaged in this process. So um, very interesting to um, see uh, when you observe it. And you will observe it if you look for it. So I would keep an eye out when you're being served and different things that are occurring uh, and uh, see the difference and notice the difference. And then ask yourself, what is it that they're doing differently? Is there anything I can take away and learn from this uh, and apply myself? It's, it's, I don't think people think about those things often enough. Patterns of worker interdependence and cooperation. Well, some jobs you could be pretty much independent and you're not that reliant on other people. But most jobs, there's a lot of interdependence and cooperation. Uh, a lot of if you if we're in manufacturing tons of interdependence and cooperation right everybody this is part of a vast system uh, that you're just one of those little cogs and how it fits in the overall network of the system is very very important and sometimes one little part of the system breaking down can cause ripple effects outwards uh, so interdependence and cooperation becomes really important. And sometimes companies get what we call silos. So you got this massive company and you got sales and marketing, you got operations, you got quality control, uh, you got finance. And they're kind of en they're entities of themselves. And sometimes they're missing how everything connects together. And there's actually putting up barriers between the different silos. Uh, that cause a disadvantage to the company as a whole. And so in a way, they're actually shooting themselves in the foot. That can be actually uh, problematic uh, as well. So uh, in a team environment uh, where you've got high interdependence and cooperation, it's very important to put into play uh, components uh, in the system that will allow the team to work better, more effectively. And we'll talk about some of those things as we go through the course, to be sure. So uh, in the book I used to use, uh, they used to mention this sort of uh, stars, guardians, and foot soldiers, job types. And it kind of makes a lot of sense. Uh, broke uh, jobs into different types of jobs. And a foot soldier is, well, we'll start off with stars. So a star is when a bad performance is not too bad, 
but a good performance is really good like it's fantastic um, so that's usually a star job uh, so when a bad performance not too bad but a good performance very good guardians are when a bad performance is a disaster and a good job is well it's expected uh, so when a bad performance is a disaster but a good performance is only slightly better than average foot soldier is kind of it's you can't sink you you're not in a position to really sink the company and you're not really in a, a position to make the company you're one of the one of the uh, required components to make sure that things move forward okay uh, so if those are foot soldiers a tradesperson would be a, a foot soldier as an example uh, in a project uh, stars you know a good a good example maybe of uh, a star would be you know when a when a bad performance is not too bad so um, if you're if you're I'm trying to think of one right now well let me do guardians first guardians is easy because you're engineers engineers is easy to think of it that way so you're a structural engineer you design a bridge usually you're not getting this raving review uh, that the bridge oh my god the bridge is still up it hasn't collapsed yet but if the bridge collapses, everybody's coming for you. So you think about the, there was a couple of bridges last uh, year that collapsed, right? Why did they collapse? Everybody wants to know why. Who designed this uh, bridge? Everybody wants to know, right? But all the time the bridge was up, well, the one, one that was in Italy was up a long time. Nobody was saying, oh my God, it's still up, it's still up, right? Um, stars, we could use uh, an example, I guess, with uh, Starchitect. Uh, these architects like Frank Gehry um, designed some really uh, outstanding kind of uh, buildings and that sort of thing that get a, a lot of notoriety and, and um, popular uh, press, uh, Starchitect. Um, so if it's somebody like a Frank Gehry, if he's a little bit off his game on one of them, he doesn't get uh, the same kind of um, applause, let's say, about it. But it's not the end of the world for him. He'll just do another one, and it'll probably be a little bit tweaked the difference. And be if it really makes a, a splash, then it's like, wow, right? Um, foot soldier, as I said, just somebody doing their day-to-day -day job. Nothing that's um, too much that stands out. So you really have to look at the jobs in particular and sort of come up with um, those kind of uh, uh, aspects. Now, there's there's some where you could say, well, they're a star and they're a guardian in a way. Um, you could think Steve Jobs was definitely a star for Apple when he came back, but he was also kind of being a guardian given that they were on the verge of bankruptcy and he had to do a lot of things that weren't really of star nature. So you might have to cross uh, over in some cases. So sometimes things aren't pure one way or the other, but that would be an example where Definitely, he came out being a star as far as being innovative, even though he had people that, that were coming up. He still had to sell it, do the story behind it, say yes or no to it, uh, but at the same time, make certain decisions that would be uh, guardian-wise, uh, cut out certain products. I think they had too many products when he first came back in the late 90s and uh, just to save the company so it didn't go into bankruptcy. So those are some of the uh, different positions, that ways you can think of things. And as I said, don't, don't take things as 200% uh, like it, this is, has to be this, this has to be that. The real world doesn't always work in that sort of black and white environment, but there is a lot there uh, that uh, falls under these categories. So I've got these questions here. So if you've watched this before lecture two, if you can go through these, we'll, we'll discuss some of these questions and others uh, during the synchronous process. Um, I'd like you to think a little bit about habits, routines that you use to help you reach your overall goals, other potential habits, processes, systems that are helpful in other areas, what works for you in a developing a habit, what are the components that makes you successful in developing a habit. Um, and then we'll talk about some of these other ones. I'll let you think about these a little bit uh, during the um, off time. And then when we meet up, we'll see what you come up with. Okay, so that's uh, part two of lecture two. I hope you have a wonderful day. I'm Tom Stevenson, and we'll see you uh, soon. Have a great day.